basis effect in a particular individual does not depend, according to Leibniz, either on God's decree of giving some particular efficacious or inefficacious assistances, or exclusively on the power of created will. On the contrary, it depends on a conjunction of concurrence factors among which we find the resistance of the created will, the previous status of the soul, and the internal and external circumstances which contribute to fix the attention in certain clear or confused thoughts. All of these factors ultimately become unified and connected to each other in the total order of things that God decided to create. And I quote, those favorable circumstances by virtue of which it happens that an equal measure of grace has a diverse efficacy in different individuals do not come from us, but recast themselves in the series of things that is partially in the divine intellect, partially in the divine will. The reason is that in the possibility of things, creatures are conditionally considered by the divine intellect together with those things which could stand, stand with them in the case they were put into existence." End of quote. The effect of grace depends on the order of things in which it is inserted. That is why God's decree to give certain particular graces must be taken from the complete order of things which God had chosen among the infinite possible. <coughs> so, the interpretation of the sentence God wants every man to be saved as an expression of the divine will of giving everyone the sufficient grace allows ascribing a real effect to the antecedent will in a way that saves its seriousness. By virtue of God's universal, uh, universal salvific will, in the actual series of things, which is the most perfect, every individual has the sufficient grace, internal as well as external, to be saved in the case they wanted to. Although it is certain and determined that some of them will not use such assistance. Although the antecedent will of saving everyone does not obtain in all cases its ultimate target or its full effect, it obtains at least an immediate effect in every individual, the presence of the distinct thoughts that are in their souls. However, this effect is diminished or muffled to a certain degree in each of them. These limitations, which determine the series of perceptions and volitions of each substance, come from the individual nature and from the reciprocal accommodation between, between, within the totality of the universal order, which is the only object of the divine creating decree. So, Leibniz's notion of sufficient grace becomes perfectly reducible to the fundamental principles of NC and UCD, which rule the whole question of predestination. However, with this interpretation of the distinction of antecedent and consequent will, it is difficult to satisfy the second requirement for which it was originally conceived. That is, that the divine will could suffer a sort of conditioning from the created will. <clears throat> Leibniz knows that in the common use of this distinction, the final divine will is called consequent since it is subsequent to the de facto consideration of the free actions of the creature. Nevertheless, Leibniz thinks that within that distinction, the priority and posteriority must not only be understood with regard to the free will of the creature, but mainly to the different degrees of God's will. I quote, God's will can be called consequent not only in relation to creatures' actions considered with priority in divine intellect, but also in relation to other divine wills. According to this last statement, it is possible to draw at least two conclusions. In the first place, Leibniz does not allow any conditioning of the divine will by the actually existing creature which is plainly incompatible with NC and UCD. But at most, by the creature conceived supratione possibilitatis, such as, as is represented in the divine intellect. In the second place, the only thing which can put some real obstacle to the divine will 
is not the actual free will of the creature, but other incompatible divine antecedent wills, antecedent wills, as a result of which the final outcome is produced due to the prevalence of the will following the strongest reason. So Leibniz prefers and never abandons the strategy based on the NC and UCD principles, which allow him to solve the most complex co controversies in the simplest way. Leibniz solves his dilemma on predestination by accepting a slightly mitigated version of the distinction between divine wills, as long as it can be reduced to his main premises. In doing so, he clearly neglect, neglects an important aspect this distinction had in its original sense, but this would uh, have forced him um, to introduce a dramatic or taking risk feature in the relation between the divine will and the free will of the creature. One may ask whether this neglected feature is essential or not for a successful defense of God's justice and for exonerating him of being the ultimate source of sin and damnation. But that question is out of the scope of this paper. Thank you very much. <laughs>